أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مبنهم يا أجشان كربلاء ما خاب من تمسك بكم والأمنا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأصدق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقال الرسول يا ربي إن قوم اتقضوا هذا القرآن محجورا أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم If I can ask one more time for everyone to just move forward a little bit, both the brothers and the sisters. There's a lot of space in the corner. You might even get a wall seat if you rush. Um, there's a lot of space over here. Please recite one more salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sisters, if you don't mind, there's a lot of space. If I can, there's a lot of space in the back over there. I know it's tough, but it feels nice when you're seated next to each other. Are there more people outside? Is there any other people trying to get inside? Yeah, there's a lot of space. There's a lot of space. We'll make it work. The seat right there, the seat right here. <laughs> if I could ask you to recite one more salawat. <laughs> Amongst the biggest hurdles in religious communities is the accessibility of religious text and religious knowledge. For many people, they state that their failure to grow in their spirituality is due to a failure of accessibility when it comes toward religious leaders or when it comes to an understanding of those most classical texts. For most people, when we talk about the whole of the Qur'an, the whole of the Qur'an is something that is very valuable to us. It's something that we keep in our homes, not just one copy, but probably half a dozen copies for every single individual in the household. We have Qur'an that is hung up on our walls, in our living room, in our bedrooms. But for whatever reason, the Qur'an is only seen as a ceremonial text because we feel that it is not accessible to us. Today, when you come and take a look at what we have in terms of religious knowledge, we have translations of not only the whole of Qur'an, but religious text all across the board. That of An-Nahj al-Balagha, and that of As-Sahifat al-Sajjadiyya, and that of Kitab al-Kafi. All of our most fundamental texts are translated in the English language and languages really all across the world in order that people have an understanding of that which is before them. But again, for whatever reason, when it comes toward discussing the whole of Qur'an, it's something that we read during the holy month of Ramadan, but not something that many people understand. And in fact, people only see the Qur'an as valuable for a couple of different things. For instance, maybe the two most popular questions that I receive, like via email, like on a month-to-month -month basis, is number one, can you take istikhara for me from the whole of Qur'an? 
And number two, can you tell me what verses of Quran I should read um, you know, for my cousin's wedding ceremony? And I'm not exaggerating, I probably get requests of each of those at least five or ten times a month, right? Tell everyone the same exact answer, like when it comes toward istikhara, like understanding that like you are your biggest istikhara, right? And number two, like choose any verses of the whole Qur'an at a wedding ceremony. You're trying to bring blessing to the gathering and every verse of the whole Qur'an like offers a sense of blessing. But again, we only see the Qur'an as a means of a ceremonial book. Something that we hang up on the wall, something that we open up during the month of Ramadan or in difficulties or in trials. But otherwise, we see it as something incredibly distant from us. And when we take a look at the Qur'an itself and traditions of the Prophet and his family والسلام, we see like what incredible emphasis that we have on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's literally the means and the mechanism by which we understand God, by which He communicates with every single one of us. But because of a difficulty when it comes to translations or because for whatever reason we feel that we are not ready to read the whole Qur'an, we are not ready to engage in religion and spirituality, so on and so forth, again, we distance really ourselves from it, not that the Qur'an is distant from us. And really we see that this is something that comes from shaitan. When people say, for instance, I'm not ready for Qur'an, I'm not ready to go for hajj, I'm not ready to go and make ziyarah. Like what does that mean that I'm not ready? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to these things in order that it makes us sort of allow for the development of our hearts and our souls so there's an opportunity for growth. Are we ever going to be ready for an experience like that of performing the Hajj pilgrimage? Every day you have to grow and every day you have to seek a new sense of closeness toward the Creator. We're never going to be ready, ready. Our life is going to be a journey. And maybe at the end of it, finally we understand something when it comes toward the ma'rafa of the Creator. For most people, we probably haven't opened up the Qur'an, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but many of us, we probably haven't opened up the Qur'an, you know, maybe since last month of Ramadan. We're talking three or four months, we have not opened up the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man, one day, he comes to the Prophet alayhi salam, and he says, O Messenger of God, I need some advice. He says, sure, how can I help you? He says, I am going through financial difficulties. He said, what has hindered you from reciting 25 verses of the Quran every single day? Another man comes to the Messenger salam. He says, oh Messenger of God, I need some advice. He said, I've been really, really ill and nothing is working. He said, what has hindered you from reciting 25 verses of the Quran every single day? He didn't say that the anecdote or the, or the antidote that allows for your financial growth or for your physical sort of health is that you read 25 verses of the Qur'an. Rather he states, what has hindered you? Meaning the only thing that stops us from reciting the whole Qur'an is ourselves, is our soul, is our heart. The ability that we do not have is what is known as tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that there's a sense of divine providence, divine support that allows people to actually engage with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, I don't mean this to be critical, I speak to myself before I speak to anyone else. What is my relationship with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it something that I read or is it not something that I read? Is it something that I just listen to for entertainment because I hear some guy with a really nice voice reciting it? Or when I'm listening to it, am I really trying to understand what it is that the Qur'an is all about and what is it speaking to me in regards to. Someone might state, but I don't understand the Qur'an and the translations are so Shakespearean, how do you expect me to understand anything about it? Well, like I said before, religious knowledge today is accessible on literally every single platform that you can ever imagine. You're looking for a commentary of the whole Qur'an, like you go online and you find one. You're looking for lectures on tafsir of the whole Qur'an, like you go on YouTube and you look for them. There is plenty of knowledge available, but oftentimes again, we like to create a barrier between ourselves and the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll say this, not for any reason because we don't like the Quran, but because probably the way that religion was taught to us, or the way that religion was preached to us from when we were younger, it was about reciting the Quran and reciting it correctly. And if we recite the Quran incorrectly, that's it, you're just not good, you're, not, you're never going to be able to understand this book. 
Sunday schools, in our mosque spaces, so on and so forth. We've been told that if you do not recite it properly, this is not for you or something is wrong with you. And again, what we're trying to do during the course of these days in which we are able to take the spirit of the value of Sayyid al-Shahada al-Husayn alayhi salam is really utilize these days as a revitalization of our religion and of our spirituality. And that has to begin and that has to end with the whole Qur'an. In Ziyarat al-Nahiyya of Imam al-Zaman, Ajjarallahu ta'ala faraja, Allahumma sallam. He states to Imam al-Husayn, Kunta lil-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alihi walada, wa lil-ummati abuda, wa lil-Qur'ani sanada. He states, O oh, Imam al-Husayn, O oh, my grandfather Aba Abdullah, that to the Messenger of God you are his son. And toward this Ummah, you were its strength. And toward the Qur'an, you were its pillar. <laughs> Understanding that Ahlul Bayt salam, they are not divorced from the Qur'an in any other way. But also, when you come and take a look at the life of Imam al Hussein salam, on the night of Ashura, when the battle was supposed to take place, and we'll get into details about that on the night of Ashura, Imam al Hussein salam, he goes to Abul Fadl al-Abbas, and he says, oh my brother, go toward the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad and tell them to postpone the beginning of the battle until tomorrow during the day. And Abu al-Fadl Abbas, he says, whatever you say, oh my master. And if you think about it strategically, from a military standpoint, if the battle were to transpire at night, half a day earlier than when it actually did, the army of Imam al-Husayn salam would have had a little bit more energy. It was taking place during the night. They were thirsty. During the night is better than being under the sun. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam explains himself. And he tells Abu al Fadl Abbas, the reason why I want this night is because I love to pray and because I love to recite the whole Quran. Meaning that he gave everything in the way of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But again, for whatever reason, we see this book is so distant from us. So I thought that tonight, inshallah, very briefly I thought I'd make or offer a little bit of clarity in regards to what the Qur'an is. Because as much as we talk about the value of the Qur'an, we still see ourselves as very distant from it. We could talk about the merit of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could talk about the lessons and the values that it calls to. We could choose specific verses and do its commentary and so on and so forth. But when it comes toward a very bird's eye view of exactly what this text is, I think it's a good place for every single one of us to start in order that we begin to, again, re-engage with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only see it as something that I have downloaded on my phone, that I want to use this verse when I want to prove something to my friends, or so on and so forth, but rather it's something that is actually a part of our life. Because again, when the Messenger salam, he tells these companions of his, what has hindered you from reciting 25 verses of the whole Qur'an every single day? I need to ask myself the question, what really is hindering me from reciting 25 verses of the Qur'an every single day? Why am I so distant from the mechanism by which God uncovers darkness and pushes us forth into light? The book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down to the Messenger alayhi salam as a means to bring us out of ignorance and into knowledge. Why is it that I'm not engaged with the whole of Qur'an? And I want to reflect upon this conversation in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of asking the question exactly what is the Qur'an? Secondly, in terms of understanding how is it that we should read the Qur'an? And thirdly, in terms of recognizing the compiler of the Qur'an in and of itself. So let's go to dimension number one, in which we want to understand what is the Qur'an. We as Muslims, we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the Qur'an toward the Messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. <laughs> Through the archangel Jibra'il. And thus the Qur'an is defined in very sort of simple language as the word of God as revealed to Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. It's the word of God as revealed toward the Prophet, meaning it's not the words of the Prophet again, but it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And the Prophet السلام, he is the divine representative of God on earth. Meaning he is not only the messenger, but every word of his is the message in and of itself. The Prophet السلام, he's not a mailman who comes and drops off the Quran and he doesn't know exactly what's in it. But he comes and he gives us the text because that's the word of God. And he tells us how to apply the word of God in the way that we should practice it. So for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us within the whole Qur'an to pray. How do we pray? We come and we take a look at the sunnah of the Prophet salam, his words, his actions, his, his, his advices, all as a means that clarify for us exactly what the Qur'anic values call to. And that is how we understand what the sunnah of the Prophet salam is. But it's the words of the Qur'an that we have in front of us that are directly the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet salam, he is the interpreter of those words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also important to note that when we try to define the Qur'an, the Qur'an is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as spoken in the Arabic language. Meaning that the translation that we have of the Qur'an in front of us or the translations that we have in abundance that's not the Qur'an. That's a translation of the Qur'an that does its best towards servicing individuals who don't understand the Arabic language. But the word of Allah is that again which is in the Arabic language presented toward us within his book. Someone says, okay, how am I supposed to understand this Qur'an that you're telling me to understand, that you're telling me to engage with, if I myself don't understand the Arabic language? You go and you see that across the world, in the Muslim, in, in, uh, across the Muslim world, even during the early days as the expansion of Islam began to take place, there were plenty of people who didn't understand the Arabic language. And even during the time of the Prophet ﷺ himself, and even during the first 30 or 40 or 50 years after the advent of the Messenger ﷺ, we see that Islam began to spread in Arabic-speaking countries as we know them today. But the Qur'an that we have in front of us is the Arabic that was spoken in the Qurayshi dialect, meaning the people of Hijaz. So people outside of that small region, they also didn't speak that same language. Meaning that for them, it was also something that was distant. So you can't say that I understand the Arabic language, now all of a sudden I understand the Qur'an. The true individual who understands the Qur'an is the one who understands the language during that day. If you go and you study English from a hundred years ago, it's a little bit different than it is now, right? In fact, some things that 18-year-old kids say, like on this college campus, I have no idea. I think I have translators from my students over here. When I, when I don't know what they're saying, I say, can you translate this for me in English, right? Because that language just rapidly changes so fast. And in a hundred years after that, language is going to change even more so. When we are in college and we take a course on Shakespeare, for instance, Again, those translations that we always say are Shakespearean. We don't understand this. We need a professor who can come and teach that language to us in order for him or her to identify the meaning of that which is beyond or behind that poetic prose and that text and so on and so forth. But again, that does not mean that we cannot engage with the whole Qur'an if we don't understand the language. It's about making an effort and it's about striving. Yes, we go and we read those translations and we do our very best toward understanding the depths of the values that the Qur'an calls to. And you read commentaries and you read books, and like I said before, knowledge is super accessible these days, literally at our fingertips, right? And if you don't know what those resources are, then let me know, look it up. I'm happy to sort of connect you to places where you can find that knowledge in order that you're able to understand the depths of the whole Qur'an. And through striving and putting forth an effort, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves that effort. And when you read the Qur'an in your own language, don't think that it's not going to be something that is not going to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a really beautiful hadith that I read the other day from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala He states, إِنَّ الرَّجُلُ الْأَعْجَمِي مِنْ أُمَّتِي لَيَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ بِأَجْمَتِهِ فَتَأَرَّفَهُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ he states that the one who recites the Qur'an in their own language, meaning a language different than the Arabic language, the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take that recitation and present it toward God in its original word. 
So you put forth the effort and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the essence and is the beauty and is the reward of it. But again, it's about striving and putting forth an effort. Everything takes time. You can't all of a sudden start to read a translation, open up a couple of texts, and everything is going to become clear to you. Life is a process. And religion is a really, really big part of that process. You can't all of a sudden wake up in the morning and never taking a, taking a course in physics and saying that I want to sit in a PhD physics level class. You're not going to understand anything. You can't be upset when you leave that class and say, how come I don't understand anything about physics? You need to start with the prerequisites before you're able to understand the depths of the science in and of itself. And you need to start slowly. And if you try to overwhelm yourself, you're going to keep on falling. And you're not going to get back up. And you're not going to strive to learning a little bit more. And in a tradition from the Prophet والسلام, he states, Inna ashraf ummati hamalat al-Qur'an wa ashab al-layl That surely the most noble people of my ummah, of my community, are the reciters of the Qur'an, or they're the carriers of the Qur'an, and they're the people who spend the night in prayer. And some of the commentators of this tradition, they state that in paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, last year I spoke a little bit about the reality of paradise as God speaks to it within the whole Qur'an. And I mentioned that there are different levels. The highest level of paradise is that which is within the proximity of Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. That which we are seeking every night and every day and every moment of our lives. And inshallah we'll get there. But within paradise, there are going to be communities, there are going to be villages, there are going to be cities. And the leaders and the mayors, for instance, or the governors of each and every one of these towns, of each and every one of these villages, are going to have certain characteristics. Not which of those individuals has the largest financial support from this you know, company or that organization, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, those who are the leaders of paradise, those who have the highest of rank are those who are the holders or the carriers of the Qur'an. Meaning those who not only read it and recite it and memorize it, but they're the ones who are engaged with it. They're the ones who are immersed in it. They're the ones who spend their nights and their days seeking the knowledge of that which is within the whole Qur'an and those who spend their night in prayer. So when we come toward understanding what is the Qur'an against the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as revealed toward Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma sallam. Now how was it revealed toward the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam? When we come toward the issue or the discussion around revelation, we see that there are two different words that are spoken to within the whole Qur'an about the revelation of the whole Qur'an. The first one of these words is what is known as al-inzal and the other one is what is known as al-tanzil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, for instance, Inna bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. That surely we revealed it on the night of qadr, the night of power during the holy month of Ramadan. What is that it? That it is the whole Quran, and that is unanimous according to all Muslims. And then we have other verses of the whole Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that He reveals these verses, He reveals these chapters, He reveals these insights at different times during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are different occasions, for instance, a man comes toward the Prophet and he says, O oh Rasulullah, tell me when the Day of Judgment is going to be. And at that moment, Jibra'il comes toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, excuse me, uh, Jibra'il goes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Messenger alayhi salam and he says, O Messenger of God, when that man asks you about the Day of Judgment, tell him that that knowledge is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone comes toward the Prophet alayhi salam and he says, what is the story of Yusuf that I hear my Christian friends and my Jewish friends talking about? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the story of Yusuf. So we come and we see that there are two sort of issues when it comes toward the con conversation around revelation. One is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the entirety of the Qur'an toward the heart of the Messenger alayhi salam every year on the night of Laylatul Qadr. And on the other side, that He reveals the certain occasions or the reasons for revelation, or, or, or as we have within the Quranic sciences, what is known as Asbab al nuzul There are certain instances where the Prophet was brought forth that insight 
from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the mechanism of the archangel Jibra'il to the Prophet salam in order that he's able to bring forth that wisdom to his contemporaries at that very moment. So the Prophet salam he has that knowledge within his heart, but again, it gets sparked upon instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone following so far? So when it comes toward understanding then what is the whole Qur'an, it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as revealed toward the Prophet. It was revealed to the Prophet numerous occasions directly to his heart in its entirety and on other instances specific verses was, were revealed to him or re-revealed to him upon occasion, upon necessity or upon the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also, to also, it's also important to note that when it comes toward the whole Qur'an, that we have to understand its verses in two different folds. There are verses that are revealed in Mecca, and there are verses that are revealed in the holy city of Medina. The beginning of the prophetic message takes place in the holy city of Mecca, and then the Prophet ﷺ, he migrates to the holy city of Medina, where eventually he passes away and he's buried. But the religion of Islam is born within the holy city of Mecca and the Prophet Salam's followers were very few during those days. And again, he's preaching to a community that was void of any sense of morality, that was void of any sense of virtue. So the themes that the Qur'an speaks to in Mecca were more towards speaking toward Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were talking about prophethood and stories of previous prophets, for instance. They were talking about the Day of Judgment. They were talking about reward. They were talking about punishment. They weren't talking about issues of law because the first step is to get people to believe and then telling them exactly how to practice. Oftentimes, we do things really, really wrong when we're trying to explain our religion to other people. A lot of people during the last couple of days, they asked me, how can I explain Ashura? How can I explain the majlis of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to my friends? How can I explain the poetry? How can I explain the ma'tam? How can I explain the black? How can I explain all of these rituals? You can't all of a sudden start to explain rituals if they don't understand the anecdote in and of itself and how central it is to our theology, toward our understanding. That we see Hussein alayhi salam not only as the grandson of the Messenger of God, but the inheritor of the divine knowledge of the Prophet And losing the grandson of the Messenger of God is a loss for all of humanity because again, he is the inheritor of the Qur'an, he is the inheritor of prophetic wisdom. So when it comes toward understanding ritual, that's something that can only be discussed after we understand exactly who is Hussein and what he stands for within our tradition. We start with theology and then we talk about practice. In Mecca, the verses of the Qur'an spoke toward theology, belief, believing in what? Believing in God, believing in the previous prophets, believing in a day of judgment, believing in reward, believing in punishment, believing in respecting your parents and your neighbors and your friends and just being a good person. And then after that, you can talk about prayers, you can talk about fasting, you can talk about hajj, you can talk about zakat and khums and all of these other rituals and legalistic sort of um, uh, commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which take place in Medina. So again, when you come and take a look and you're reciting the whole Qur'an, the majority of verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, for instance, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, they're more likely to be revealed in Mecca. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the whole Qur'an, Ya ayyuhan ladina amanu, O you who believe, most likely those verses are revealed in Medina. Then, what is the Qur'an? And when we're reading, you're able to all of a sudden start to pick up upon these insights. Ask yourselves the question, was this verse revealed in Mecca or Medina? Think about it, contemplate. And you'll be able to see the Qur'an itself will be a mechanism that allows for our hearts to develop out of the wisdom and out of the providence and of the miracle of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in and of itself. Please recite one salawat ala Muhammad. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible, but if I could ask the sisters to move forward one more time, if it's possible. There's a lot of... Uh, people I can imagine that are still outside that are trying to get in. And if I could ask the guys to move forward, to move toward my left, to your right, so that the sisters can take over the central space, that would be helpful.
And this brings me then to the second dimension of my discussion, and that is in regards to how should we be the reciters of the whole of Qur'an? How should we engage with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In the verse that I began with in chapter 25, verse 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولِ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّقَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مَحْجُورًا he states, he's quoting the Prophet of God, he states, and the Messenger will state, meaning and Muhammad وسلم, will state, O oh my Lord, surely my people, my community has forsaken the Qur'an. When we go toward commentators of the Qur'an, we come and we see that one group of commentators, they state that these are the words of the Prophet السلام, as he spoke in Mecca when people were not being receptive toward his verses meaning the verses of God, as he would preach to them. But within many commentaries within the school of Ahlul Bayt, including that of Tabat Taba'i and Al-Mizan, he states that this verse of the Qur'an is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala foreshadowing what is going to take place on the Day of Judgment. That on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hear the complaint of the Messenger of God, وَقَالَ Rasul, And the Messenger states, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabbi inna qawm ittaqadhu haad al-Qur'ani mahjura That, oh Allah, my community, they didn't see any value, any importance to this book. That's going to be the complaint of the Messenger of God. Think about how is it that we engage the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you need an istikhara, you ask the shaykh, I don't know if I should marry this person. I don't know if I should get into this business. I don't know if I should buy this vacuum cleaner. I don't know if I should do this. I'm not joking. Think about how silly that is for just a moment. Think about that. Think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you an intellect. He gave you Amazon reviews as well. <laughs> Take a look at that. Do your research, man. Shaykh, I want to know what verses of Quran I should read at my friend's wedding. Open up Surah Al-Fatiha for God's sake. Open up the Quran. Alhamdulillah, you're opening, it, you're opening the Quran to your friend's wedding. What's going to happen after the wedding? God knows. <laughs> or during or after you recite the Quran. We need to understand that it's not a book that we just keep in our homes that look really, really nice and that are really, really fancy. What are we doing? How many apps of the Quran do you have on your phone? Hopefully you have at least one. But if you have six and seven, you can probably go on your iPhones and see when's the last time you open up those apps. And sometimes, if you don't open up the app for a long time, you need to re-download it. So go and open up your phone and see when the last time you open up, you open up that Qur'an app. And if it has like that iCloud symbol next to it, that means you haven't read the Qur'an in a really long time. So open it up and read it. It's literally at our fingertips. Imagine five minutes a day. I say this all the time. Five minutes, no. One minute a day you recite the Qur'an. One minute a day. One minute a day in your commute, when you're going to work, when you're going to school, before you go to sleep, when you wake up, whatever. One minute a day. What's that going to do for you? Is it going to ruin your life? Is it going to be so difficult? Is that so challenging? I'm talking to myself before I'm talking to anyone else. One minute a day. 60 seconds. And then after one month, you increase it to two minutes a day. Then after... After two months, you increase it to three minutes a day. And at the end of a year, you're at 12 minutes a day. That's amazing. Someone says 12 minutes a day, you're kidding me? No, man. That's how, many, how much percentage more than you started in day one. You made a step in the right direction. Right? You can't quit immediately after all of a sudden you forgot one day, you skip one day, you start again. You read two minutes if you didn't recite, you recite yesterday. You start one minute, you're reciting for one week. For instance, you forget one day. No worries, after the day after that, read for two minutes. What's that going to take? Then go and do whatever it is you have to do. I speak to myself first. It's not that difficult. It's something that we create the habit of. Which is why when we come toward understanding the etiquettes of that recitation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we find within the traditions of the Prophet and his family alayhim wasalam, number one, we do not want to be a people. We do not want to be those people who the Messenger السلام, is complaining about on the Day of Judgment. That my people, they are those who, forso- who, 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 who had forsaken the whole of Qur'an. So let's engage with it. 
and we start. We start tonight in the name of the Barakah of Sayyid al-Shahada al Hussein alayhi salam that I'm going to start reciting the Qur'an. In the name of Hussein, I'm going to recite the Qur'an. In the name of the Messenger of God, I'm going to start reciting the Qur'an. And I want his blessing and I want his uh, Barakah to be as part of this recitation. That's it. And you start. You slip one day, you start again tomorrow. What's that going to take? You go and you see, again, when we go to where the traditions of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, they state that amongst the etiquettes of the whole Qur'an, they're sort of in twofold. The first fold are those external etiquettes, and the second fold are those which are the spiritual or internal etiquettes. When it comes to the external etiquettes of engaging in the Qur'an, tradition state, for instance, at the place where you sleep, keep the Qur'an next to you. Keep the Qur'an next to you where you sleep on your nightstand, for instance. Right? Or in a drawer nearby, or on a bookshelf nearby. You wake up in the middle of the night, you can't sleep, you pick up the Qur'an and you'll read some verses. It's on your phone, open it up, read a couple of verses. You can't, you can't sleep, for instance. Your spouse making you know, too much noise while they're you know, snoring or they're moving around. Or in my case, my daughter kicks me in the face. Right? I wake up, I can't sleep. Look, read three verses, read two verses. Sometimes you just can't sleep at night and you're tossing and you're turning. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to hear your voice. You get up, you make dua, make wudu, say some prayers, recite a couple of verses. This is one amongst the etiquettes of reciting the whole Qur'an. Amongst the other physical etiquettes of reciting the whole Qur'an as we find within our traditions, and these are within ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, they're not something that I'm making up, is that you should have a good fragrance in your mouth when you're reciting the whole Qur'an. Someone says that's so silly, right? What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to do with that? No, it's about understanding again that our physical is a mechanism that really cultivates the spiritual. Right? That's why before you pray, we're told to brush our teeth. You make wudu, you put on fragrances. It creates a positive environment and a seriousness for that which you're about to engage. Right? That's why like when you come to the majlis, like wear deodorant. Put on some cologne. That's why I said it should be nice to sit next to people, right? And everyone started laughing and I started wondering, oh man, what's the reason why people don't want to sit next to people? I've given this anecdote last year, I think during Muharram, but nonetheless I'll say it again for those of you who are not here. It said there was once this lady, her name was Zainab. Zainab, she was a individual who lived in the holy city of Medina during the time of the Prophet And she was someone who had real intense ma'rifah of the Prophet This lady was really incredible. And her profession was that she would go door to door towards selling perfumes. So it is said that one day she was walking in the streets of Medina and she reached the door of the house of the Prophet And she knocked the door and the Prophet happened to be the one to open the door. And she has this bag full of perfumes and fragrances and so on and so forth. And the Messenger says, Ya Zainab ta'atarti bayti that, oh Zainab, you've made my house smell really beautiful. And look at the response on this woman. She really understands the messenger. This is what I'm talking about when we talk about it. Understanding the one that we are here to grieve over. She responds, Ya Rasulullah ta'attarta samawati wal arf. O messenger of God, and you are the one who has allowed for a beautiful fragrance to be eminent in this world and in the heavens. She understands the Messenger of God. Of course, the fragrance of the Messenger of God والسلام, was not a fragrance that was of any cologne, it was his natural odor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled within him. But he would tell us numerous times within ahadith about the importance, for instance, about fragrance. Anyhow, so amongst the etiquettes of reciting the whole Qur'an, brushing your teeth, putting on fragrance, facing the qibla, again, all things that are physical, reciting the Qur'an in a melodious voice. Someone says, man, I can't recite like Zuhair. I call Zuhair the voice of the community. I call, I was, I call him the voice of God, but someone said I was being shook. So I said, let's leave that for Morgan Freeman. <laughs> okay, I'm doing shirk now. Bad joke? Besides that a lot. So someone says, I can't, I don't have a melody, a melody of voice. I don't have, well, you try your best. Recite it in a way that's loud according to our traditions. Loud enough for you to hear your own voice. Again, because it creates something. 
That when you're listening to the Qur'an, that you actually listen to it. And you don't converse over it, for instance. Listen to it in the car, listen to it. You listen to it while you're working on the computer, don't talk toward the person next to you. Put it on mute and then continue that conversation. That when you're reciting the Qur'an, look at the verses. Because there's blessing for the one who looks at the verses. There are numerous other rituals in terms of that which we have recommendations when it comes toward the etiquette, the adab of the recitation of the whole Qur'an. And then we also go toward those spiritual sort of etiquettes. That is that before you recite the Qur'an, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. That when you begin to recite the whole Qur'an, and when you start to recite verses that speak toward paradise, you say, oh Allah, give me paradise. That when you recite verses that talk about punishment, that again you're in a conversation because you understand that this is the way that God is speaking to you. So you have to respond to God. Prayers is the way that we talk to God. And the Qur'an is the way that God speaks to us. So when God is saying that the believers, they are the ones who get paradise, and they sit on couches with rivers beneath them, you say, oh Allah, give me this. And then when God talks about punishment, you say, oh Allah, save me from this. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is, there is a reward for those who are patient, and there is a reward for the mu'mineen and the muttaqeen, you say, oh Allah, make me from amongst the patient, make me from amongst the mu'mineen, make me from amongst the muttaqeen. You read it, and again, you're in a conversation with it as well. And then this brings me toward the third dimension of my discussion for tonight. And that is, in terms of who is the compiler of the whole Qur'an? This conversation in and of itself could be an entire lecture in and of itself. But because I received this question from a couple of people over the last couple of months, I thought that let me just run through the different opinions in regards toward who compiled the whole Qur'an and how is it that we have this book in the way that we have it in front of us today. Because when you go online and you Google who compiled the Qur'an, you're going to find a whole lot of information, a lot of books and a lot of articles. And there have been different polemical debates and discussions over the last several you know, decades, if not centuries, in regards toward the compiler of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are three different opinions that I want to just run by really, really quickly because I know that my time is running out. The first opinion is that the whole Qur'an was compiled after the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam by the first caliph Abu Bakr. Some will argue that Abu Bakr was the one who compiled the version of the Qur'an as we know it today within our hands, that book that is on the shelves, that book which, which is within our phones and so on and so forth, by providing a couple of unique evidences. And the first evidence for that is that soon after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, there were several battles that took place during the lifetime of the Khadafa of the first caliph. And amongst those battles is what is known as the Battle of Yamama. In this particular battle, Abu Bakr, he appoints Khalid ibn Walid to be the general of his army toward fighting a personality by the name of Musaylama al-Kadhab, a man who claimed prophethood after the Messenger alayhi salam. Meaning that he, again, he claimed to be a prophet and he stated that Muhammad is not the last prophet, but I am the last prophet. And he stated that he has a Qur'an himself and he began reciting lines of poetry and many people actually believed and followed him, followed his words and believed that he was a divinely revealed prophet. So this battle transpires and upwards of 900 people, if I'm not mistaken, were killed during the course of this battle. And amongst those 900 people were 400, according to different reports, memorizers of the whole Qur'an. Now I want to just take one step back in allowing for everyone to understand one thing. Back in that day, when the Qur'an was being recited, they didn't have people sort of typesetting it right away. They didn't have you know, recorders on their phones to record the recitation of the Qur'an. So the way that the Qur'an was compiled was for instance on the back of leaves, on the bones of animals, on the skin of animals. And also by means of oral tradition. Back in that day, this is how knowledge was sort of sent down. And also there were some scribes, people, like those taking notes, mashallah, the true majlis goers of Hussein alayhi salam, or those who take notes in the majlis, benefit from it, right? Not that those of you who are not doing it are not. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to cause any drama. But there were some people who that when the Qur'an was being recited, they didn't all know exactly how to read and how to write. But those who did, they put forth their best effort toward compiling and writing to the best of their abilities. 
So when 400 memorizers of the Qur'an are killed in one battle during the course of a couple of weeks, for instance, it's going to really strike fear within the Muslim community about really the sanctity of the book and really where the knowledge of the Qur'an is. So Abu Bakr, after the battle of Yamama, he calls Zayd ibn Thabit and he asks him to recite the Qur'an and he tries to create one official codex, one official version that he would call the Codex of Abu Bakr. And thus many people, they take the opinion that this was the first official version of the Qur'an as we know it today. There are different sort of disputes and debates in regards toward this particular Codex. And Sayyid al-Khu'i in his work, Al-Bayan fi tafsir al-Qur'an, he states that there are upwards of 20 ahadith that state actually that the Qur'an was compiled before this. But the reason why the first caliph did that was again because 400 memorizers of the Qur'an had been killed. And in order to collect one volume of the Qur'an that was within sort of his hand as the leader of the Muslim world during that time, that he wanted to have one official version for himself. And that's why he asked Zayd ibn Thabit to collect the Qur'an during the course of his Khilafah. A second opinion in regards toward the compilation of the Qur'an is that the Qur'an was compiled during the Khilafah of Uthman ibn Affan, the third caliph. And the Qur'an, as again we know it today, is known as the Uthmani version of the Qur'an, or the Uthmani Codex. Many of us, again, may have heard that term. For those of you who are familiar with the Qur'an, or with early Islamic history, with Qur'anic sciences, or if you go to a museum, for instance, for instance, like those art museums that have the section on Islamic art, they will say the Uthmani Codex of the Qur'an. And someone says, why, or... What's the evidence to suggest that Uthman was the one who compiled the whole Qur'an? Again, as I mentioned earlier, that the, that the religion of Islam began to spread really, really quickly during the first 25 or 30 years after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, but even more so during the latter years of the life of the Messenger ﷺ. And as I mentioned before, the Qur'an is revealed within the Arabic dialect of the community of the Messenger ﷺ. So as Islam began to spread, you find that people would begin to recite the Qur'an within their own dialects. And for those of you who have traveled to the Arabic world, to the Middle East, or if you've studied the Arabic language, you'll see that every single community and every single culture, and even within, their, even within a country, if you go to the north of that country, their Arabic is different than the south of that country. And even within tribes, they speak differently, and they utter words, and they pronounce words differently. When I was studying in the Islamic seminary, I would go and I would try to speak the Iraqi Arabic that my wife taught me. And then they would know that I came from a really small village in the south and they say, you're not from Karbara because this is not the way that we speak. But I said, no, just please give me the watermelon at three dollars. <laughs> because I can't afford another dollar to spend. They say, well, you know, in Karbara it's four dollars. And all my friends from Karbara, they said, no, you got ripped off, it's three dollars. <laughs> So you go and you see by just the way that you speak, people are able to understand and they're able to pick it up that you're a little bit different. So again, as the Islamic empire began to spread and the Muslim world began to expand, you find that everyone would begin to recite differently. And there was a real fear that misinterpretation of the words of the Qur'an were going to take place. You know the dots, the fatha and the kasra and the dhamma and the vowels that we have within the whole Qur'an, they were not present in the original version of the Qur'an in and of itself. That was taught by Ali ibn Abi Talib toward his companion Abu Aswad al-Da'ali later on during the lifetime of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam. So what Uthman does is that he gathers together amongst the early memorizers of the whole Qur'an and he says that I want you all to write the Qur'an exactly the same way as you know it, those individuals who were present during the time of the Prophet and who understood the dialect when the Qur'an was revealed. Again, those early memorizers who lived during the time of the Messenger wasallam, And he stated that there should be an official copy of the Qur'an, one in Mecca, one in Medina, one in Kufa, one in Yemen, one in Baghdad, and one in every sort of major center of Islamic learning. And then he ordered that all of the other versions of the Qur'an should be burnt. And many times people they say, that's so controversial, how can he order the versions of the Qur'an to be burnt? We even have traditions in which Ali ibn Abi Talib said that if I was in that position, I would have done the same thing. 
So their second opinion is that the Qur'an as we have it in front of us was compiled during the time of the third caliph, Uthman ibn Affan. And the third opinion is that the Qur'an was compiled by the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma sallam. During the course of his lifetime. Someone says, what's the evidence for that? We have numerous evidences and I don't want to get into all of them, but just a couple of thoughts. That on the day in which the Prophet السلام, he recites that famous sermon, he states, Inni tarik fikum kitab Allah wa itrat bayti. That I am leaving behind you, I am leaving behind for you two things, the book of God and my family. You take a look at what is a book. A book is something that is physically in front of you. It's not something that is scattered, or scattered on different leaves, on different uh, um, animal skins, on the bones of a cow or of a goat and so on and so forth. But a book is a book. Furthermore, we have traditions that tell us, for instance, that the Prophet ﷺ says that the one who recites, for instance, Surah Al-Qadr, the reward is this. The one who recites Surah Al-Asr is this. The one who recites every chapter of the Qur'an for every single 114 of them, the reward is this. Meaning that every single one of those chapters of the Qur'an had to have been defined and had to have been understood and had to have been designated by the Prophet ﷺ himself. And on numerous occasions during the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, we would see that certain people would even state, Hasbuna kitab Allah. That it suffices for us that we have the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of us. Again, kitab Allah. And thus it's important to understand that the opinion within the school of Ahlul Bayt السلام, is that the Qur'an was compiled under the tutelage and under the instruction of the Prophet السلام, toward the end of his life as he taught Ali ibn Abi Talib and according to different traditions, Zayd ibn Thabit. And again, I'll just conclude with this point because again, I know that this conversation has a lot of information. That the Prophet والسلام, he would have not left behind us a community that was beginning to thrive during that day without any sense of understanding of the most important text that we have in front of us. That the Qur'an that we have in front of us today, the one that you open up every single day in front of you physically, or the one that you open up electronically on your phones, is that which has been taught to us exactly by the Prophet ﷺ. And thus there's a sense of value to it. There's a sense of beauty in it. So strive in terms of engaging with it, and you will find that the whole Qur'an with its unique blessing, with, unique, with its unique merit, with its unique value, will begin to speak to you in, your, in a way that's really going to create for one spiritual growth. And this leads me then to my conclusion. That the Qur'an in and of itself is significant. And the Qur'an in and of itself is our ultimate and our absolute guide. But without the Qur'an, excuse me, with the Qur'an only and without the interpreters of the Qur'an, we can sway a whole load of different ways. Which is why again the Prophet ﷺ, he states, that I'm leaving behind two things, the Qur'an and my family, the Ahlul Bayt Kitab Allah wa itrati Ahlul Bayti. And if you hold on to these two things, you will never go astray. And you find again, not 50 years, my dear friends, 50 years after the passing of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how far did people stray from the whole Qur'an? How far did people stray from the values that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to and the interpretation of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The only explanation, the only explanation, you come and you bring me a better explanation, is that they forgot the latter of those two weighty things. They killed them and they isolated them and they abused them one by one by one. 50 years after the passing of the Messenger of God السلام, the grandson of Rasulullah Muhammad Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib merit after merit that we spoke about last night and virtue after virtue is there anyone in the face of the universe during that day that compared in terms of its merit to Hussein? 
Yet you find that there were not a hundred people to stand by him as he was surrounded by 30,000 people with their swords and with their arrows. And if they didn't have swords and they didn't have arrows, they would pick up the rocks on the burning desert of Karbara, ready to strike the grandson of the messenger of God. But we'll save those details for later. Tonight is the night of the second of Muharram. A night where we traditionally recollect the leaving or the departure of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam from the city of his grandfather sallallahu alayhi wa ala. Because on the second of the month of Muharram, he reaches the holy city of Karbara, but I'll speak about that tomorrow. It is said that in the middle of the, the month of Rajab, in the year 60 after Hijrah, the Umayyad Caliph Muawiyah ibn Abba Sufyan had died. And his son Yazid ibn Muawiyah had taken control of the Muslim world. And it is said that Yazid ibn Muawiyah, by means of Marwan ibn Hakim in Damascus, sends a letter toward the governor of Medina, a man by the name of Walid ibn Utbah. That letter states that go to Hussein, the son of the messenger of God, and tell him that he has two choices. Either that he pledges allegiance to Yazid and offers a sense of legitimacy for his government or kill him. So they call Hussein alayhi salam. He comes toward the court of Walid ibn Utbah, the governor of Medina, and he says, what can I do for you? He says, Muawiyah has died. He says, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajaun. We're all gonna die. And then he says, Yazid has taken over the Muslim world. He is the Khalifat al-Muslimin, as he called himself. And he has ordered that you pledge allegiance to him. And if you do not do so, then it's my responsibility to deliver him your head. Ibn Utbah, remember he's the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, with full courage and with full bravery. And he says, Mithli la yubayi'u mithlah that a man like me will never pledge allegiance to a man like Yazid. And he says that if you think that you're going to fight me, and if you think that you're going to deliver my head, then I'm not here to cause any bloodshed. I will leave. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was foretold of this tragedy from his, from his grandfather. And he knew that this day was going to come. So it is said that he goes toward his home, and he let Zainab alayhi salam, his sister, know that today is the day in which he was foretold by the Messenger of God. The day in which has to begin their striving of patience and understanding that this journey is a journey that's going to be very challenging and a journey that's going to be very lengthy. So historical reports, they state that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam after he tells Zainab alayhi salam to prepare the women and the children and the other men within the family to get ready to depart from Medina so they can go toward Mecca because they intended to perform Hajj before they eventually arrived in the city of Karbara. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he goes to make his last ziyara of the Messenger of God. For those of you who have been for Hajj, you know that there is nothing as difficult as the last glance upon the graveside of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Doesn't matter where you come from, what part of the world you're from, there's something to the city of Medina. There's some magnetic pull of attraction. For those of you who have been there, take your hearts there for just a moment. There's something really unique about that city that offers you a sense of solace, that offers you a sense of peace. And every one of the members of Ahlul Bayt, though their bodies are scattered in different parts of the world, be it in Iraq or be it in Khurasan, they always wish that they were within the proximity of the Prophet So it is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, now he has to go and bid farewell to his grandfather Muhammad. So it is said that he goes to the grave of the Prophet, he performs Turaqah prayers, and then he stands by the grave of the Messenger of God and he calls out, As-salamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Peace be upon you, O Messenger of God. Let me introduce myself to you in case you do not know me. I am Hussein, the son of Fatima. 
I am Hussein, the son of your daughter. And look at the way that Hussein is speaking to his grandfather Muhammad. He says, oh messenger of God, today is that day that you foretold me. But it's so difficult to leave you, it's so difficult to leave your proximity. And it is said that as Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he was reciting some words to his grandfather, the Prophet alayhi salam, that he fell to the ground unconscious as he was overcome by tears. And in his dream, he saw that the Prophet alayhi salam came and he approached him. And he said, Wa alayka salam ya Habib ya Hussein. He says, Oh my dear son Hussein, and peace and blessings be upon you. He says, but remain patient because you have a responsibility and you have to attain that martyrdom that I have foretold of you. And then he begins to tell Hussein exactly again what is going to happen. And these are not my words, my dear brothers and sisters, but these are the words of a father to a son. These are the words of a grandfather toward his grandson. He says, oh Hussein, that you have to go and you have to leave Medina because I have to see all of those prophecies being fulfilled. I have to see you alone in Karbara. I have to see you thirsty in Karbara. I have to see the horses trample of your body. I have to see your body mixed in your own blood. I have to see that effort that you are going to make in my way. Oh Hussein, remain patient. Oh Hussein, go before you leave Medina to go and bid farewell to your mother Fatima to Zahra. So at that moment, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he awakes from his dream. Again, he says, Assalamu alaykum ya Rasulullah. Peace be upon you, O Messenger of God. And he gets up from Masjid al Nabawi. And for those of you again who have been for Hajj, for Umrah, you know how Baqi looks today. It is said that he directs himself toward the grave of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. And he begins to make small steps to bid farewell to his mother, recollecting everything that she had to endure as he was standing by her side in that home when the door came and struck Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. But I tell you, my friends, one narration it states that when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam left the house of Zainab toward going to visiting his grandfather Muhammad, he left with a sense of pride. He had courage, he had bravery. But when he directed himself toward the graveyard of Baqi, he was overcome by tears and emotion. He could not say the words to bid farewell to his mother Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. But I ask you, my dear friends, how could it be that only a few days later that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, that man who's the grandson of the Messenger of God, he is surrounded by 30,000 people ready to shed his blood. But I'll just leave you with this last point, my dear friends. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he begins to depart from the city of Medina and he begins to direct himself toward Mecca and he begins to go and performing that Hajj pilgrimage. But there was one occasion during the course of these days before he arrived Karbala that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he sees one of the daughters of Muslim ibn Aqil, a girl by the name of Hamida. This girl, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, was responsible for taking care of because he was her uncle. And on that day, he heard of the tragedy of Muslim ibn Aqil, his cousin who was killed. So he goes toward Hamida and he takes her and he puts her on her lap and he begins to embrace her and he begins to hug her and he begins to kiss her. She's three or four years old and Hamida says, Oh, my uncle Hussein, why is it that you're treating me like this? He says, what do you mean? I'm your uncle, I love you. He says, this is the way that you treat orphans. And at this moment, Imam al Hussein says, Oh, Hamida, my condolences to you, but I'm your father now because your father, Muslim ibn Aqil, has been killed. But I ask you, oh, Aba Abdullah, how did they treat your daughters when you were killed on the night of the 11th of Muharram? <laughs> <laughs> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by our love of the Prophet and his family alayhim as -salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by our love of the Messenger alayhi salam and his family to allow for these hearts to be purified with his forgiveness. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for these tears to be a mechanism of growth and change within our life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're able to embody the values of Muhammad and Wa Ali Muhammad. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for our lives to resemble the lives of Muhammad and Wa Ali Muhammad and our death to resemble the death of Muhammad and Wa Ali Muhammad. 
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never separate us from Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the blessing of Hussein alayhi salam to allow for us to be the reciters of the Qur'an and the contemplators of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are able to uphold these gatherings in his remembrance moving forward. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ahl baytah al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Wa rahim Allah man qara'a surat al-mubarakat al-fatah. Please recite one surat al-fatah, but before that one salawat ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma.